Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi there. Thank you so much for this. I'm, I'm coming to you from rural Nova Scotia, so uh, I really appreciate being able to look in on this. And I, I, I thank you for your commentary, Adath, uh, especially um, in the last couple of years and the things that have been going on here. Uh, the Lionel Desmond um, tragedy, as well as the Port of Pitt shooting. Um, and I really appreciate you bringing a feminist and abolitionist analysis, um, and that's sorely lacking, I think, in parts of rural Nova Scotia, for sure. Um, I wonder if you could comment on how the media coverage of the Port of Pitt shooting was not abolitionist and not feminist, and, and potentially how it could be done better. Thank you so much, and thanks for doing the Zoom. Yeah, um, I talk about the Port of Pitt shooting in the book uh, because it began with an attempted intimate partner homicide. So it's sort of the, the triggering event for that. But of course, as, as we all know now, the largest mass murder in Canadian history, if you don't count colonialism, um, and the early colonial period, was perpetrated by uh, someone who was wearing a police uniform, was not a police officer, but dressed up as a cop, to go on the shooting spree. So, um, yeah, the media really bought into this, like, Nova Scotia strong, um, let's commemorate the death of the officer, kind of like British colonial keep calm and carry on messaging uh, so that when some of us try to speak out in the, in the media and say, like, hey, wait a minute, first of all, the RCMP bungled uh, this whole situation. They didn't send out an emergency alert. They got it all wrong. And also, the person who did the shooting identified as a cop. So let's talk about the other victims, too, not just the police victim. And the thing that I think is missing from the conversation is, like, women who work in policing are at risk from their colleagues. Because usually if you're a cop, you date other cops, cops have higher rates of domestic violence perpetration in the home. Um, and in the book, I have an interview with a woman, Kelly Donovan, who is like a former police officer and whistleblower, who talks about like how terrifying it was to try and address the ways that cops were perpetrating intimate partner violence on the Waterloo Regional Police Force. Um, and so when I, when I think about the Port of Peace shooting and I think about like, the woman who was a cop who lost her life that day, I think about also what policing might have been like for her and how gender-based violence was an occupational hazard every day in her job. And how she was also the first person to put herself, like she was in an opportunity where she literally put her car and her body between her and the rest of her community to protect it. Um, and I think that's really complicated and I, we can't shut those conversations down and what, I, what Nova Scotian said was like, oh, it's not the time to critique police, you know, in the wake of the shooting. But I think it was exactly the time, and um, and, and we have to keep talking about it. Maybe we can go back to a question from the audience here. I see somebody in line. Yeah, hello. Um, some years ago, maybe five or six years ago, uh, my father. Uh, murdered his second wife, and uh, the OPP, Ontario Provincial Police, uh, they did a routine investigation, uh, and they suspected that he had killed her. Um, so they brought him in for questioning, because you know, his story didn't add up. Uh, so long story short, he was charged, tried, convicted, went to jail, and he pleaded guilty, because you know, basically he, wasn't, he didn't have too many options other than pleading guilty. Um, when he was questioned by the police, he confessed to murdering my mother, um, his first wife, uh, son in the 1982. Um, I think jail's a pretty good place for him. <laughs> I can't think of a lot of alternatives uh, to, to deal with something like that. Um, I, I think they should be sequestered from society for some time anyway. And, and so for someone like me, who's not necessarily an abolition. I mean, yeah, in an ideal world, you know, it'd be great if we could abolish prison and, and have a much better justice system and less violent police and everything. But I guess my question is this, is what are the alternatives, the realistic, viable alternatives to imprisoning a murderer? Yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that you lost your mom and I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. Um, so a few things I will say, I, I think it is perfectly 
a healthy, and I can't imagine any other way of feeling wanting that person to be in jail, and I don't think that makes you not an abolitionist or a bad abolitionist. But for me, the abolitionist position on that is to acknowledge the ways in which how, if we give all the money to police to provide like punitive approaches to harm, we don't do all the work that would have prevented those deaths from happening in the first place. So, you know, abolitionist work is also youth work. It's also figuring out who the kids are in the community that like, grow up to become school shooters, that the folks that work in our departments, like what happened at Concordia, I think it was like 1992, who get denied tenure and go on a shooting spree just a few years after the, the Montreal massacre. Like these are folks who are vulnerable and suffering for a long period of time before it happened. But here's the thing, is like, this is where I want to disrupt this idea that, that transformative justice for homicide has to include their surviving family. Because I could not, I be part of the healing project for my friend, Nick, who murdered his girlfriend. There's no way. And you wouldn't want me there. And society shouldn't want me there. Because sometimes the harm is so great that we need what, you know, Arthur Lockhart and I think it's like Lynn Zamet talked about is this idea of surrogate kin. And this is where I think white people need to play a bigger role in abolitionist projects by stepping in when the survivors already are facing so much pain and turmoil and life disruption from the harm that this person has caused. The folks who are not involved and not part of the community actually might be better positioned to be able to like do the hard work of bringing that person back into community, whether that is like from jail by sending them letters to be like, hey, do your work, figure out why you did this, Figure out why you did this, and then why don't you tell us what you think would have prevented someone like you from doing this in the first place. I mean, the truth is, is that not all people are able to feel empathy, and not all people would actually be able to have remorse. And I think that it's ableist for us to think that everyone is capable of being accountable in the same way. And that's where we have really tough decisions to make, like where I was talking about this threshold for coercion. Like, yeah, maybe in some circumstances we need to have forms of community supervision for folks who engage in really serious acts of harm. But that doesn't mean it needs to be part of like a state-sponsored, po like policing is very narrow and strategic and particular. The way that, I mean, I've given talks at the police college in Toronto, like they have like rule books on how they work. Like there are theories around how policing works. So like policing is not about enforcing consequences. Like it's a form of strategic surveillance, strategic violence and like using violence in ways to subdue a large population. And that's a very different thing, I think, than removing someone temporarily from community into a compassionate space of accountability where folks don't have to live under the fear of, of their violence anymore. Because what happens in rural communities, like, you, it, like I encourage anyone who's an abolitionist and interested in this question to look up the Philip Boudreau, uh, the, the murder for lobster case which is like this killing where a community was being terrorized by somebody and sort of made the decision to take this person out on their own. And it got spun in the media to be like a, a dispute between a few lobster fishermen, but um, CBC did a documentary about it and it showed that like what happens in situations where we don't have spaces of like accountability and compassionate care is like communities have to turn to <laughs> homicide themselves. And, and that happens in rural areas. So, you know, all of this to say that I don't think your dad should be released and back in the community. I can't imagine where that would feel okay. But I do think that defunding police and investing in the kind of prevention that we need will save lives. And will save the lives of other mothers and sisters and daughters um, in the future. Can I respond? We have time for one more question. Are you leaving out for a question? Uh, I am, but... It's okay? It's okay, yeah, if you want to respond. I think this is important. Okay, just, just briefly, I, I agree very much with everything you say, and I agree certainly with the whole preventative aspect. But my question was, when someone murders someone, what are the alternatives to putting them in prison? Or killing them for that matter? Um, and I didn't really get an answer to that, and so I'm asking, what, what, what do you and, 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 and the abolitionists propose that if there's an actual murder in your community and it's proven that this person is a murderer, what happens next? 
Okay, so I can only speak for myself. So I'm, I'm not speaking on behalf of any kind of movement. But the question that you're asking is like part of the question that I'm trying to ask too, <laughs> right? That is the question that we need to answer collectively. Because I'll tell you right now, it would feel an awful lot better if my friend who murdered his girlfriend was in community with other folks in such a way that they were able to come back, that he was able to come back and take accountability for what he'd done. And I can say with certainty that for folks who I know who are still like feeling the reverberations of the tragedy and the life that he took, if he was able to like really acknowledge the harm that was caused, it would be better for the community that was harmed. So what that space looks like, how we do it, how we make it work, what kind of values and ethics are gonna underpin that kind of system and how we're gonna fund it, those are all questions that we still need to ask. And so I'm gonna like hold that question going forward. And I think we should all hold that question going forward because it's a really, really, really important question. Last question. Um, hi, thank you so much for doing this. Um, this has been a really good panel to listen to. Um, so the Bernard Center for Women's Research has this really cool video on their YouTube channel uh, called What Are Barriers or Obstacles to Accountability? And in that video, they talk a lot about shame and specifically for perpetrators of sexual assault and violent crimes. Um, like, the idea that like there's not a road back. And so, like, kind of broadly, but touching kind of on shame. And I'll, like, I also wonder about like your friend, Nick. Um, what are the barriers to accountability there? And how do you deal with shame and bringing people back into community when, like in the example we just heard, there's like no options or it seems like there's no options? So uh, a good friend of mine, I don't have her consent to, to talk about what she told me in private, but I do want to bring it up. So uh, she's Mi'kmaq and she talks a lot about how like shame is a white supremacist. It's like how, comes from like the, the like European Christian traditions, like this idea of original sin, that we all should be ashamed of ourselves. Like, and that gets like filtered through the ways in which like white supremacist moral projects um, get compliance from people. Um, and so, you know, at, like as a settler on unceded Mi'kmaq territory, um, I want to listen to folks like uh, Duma Young, who I quoted in the book, who has talked about like the the original legal orders that existed like prior to colonization and how that you know how that worked but what what they talk about is the utility of our responses to extreme violence like those are all situated in culture and the difficulty with intimate terrorism and state terrorism is that it speaks the language of white supremacy Policing speaks the language of white supremacy. So the vocabulary of that violence, like the only legible, understandable approach to it sometimes is shame. So I understand where it's coming from. So I don't see the usefulness in saying like, shame is good, shame is bad, because like policing is a system that was set up to like control a culture that is fundamentally violent, right? That fundamentally uses violence. And so, for me, the barrier to accountability is like cultural change. And I think that white people have to account for that. Um, and so, you know, whether shame is useful or not, I mean, it depends. Like, our emotions are like culturally filtered. Um, but I do think like narcissism is something that's like profoundly taught in white supremacy. The white supremacist position is a fundamentally narcissist position. And the thing about narcissism is that it's like, it's a, it's a trigger mechanism to allow us to deflect accountability because the thing that's on the inside is so fragile and precarious. And so mar narcissism as a deflection of that, I think, is like something we need to talk about in the context of white supremacy and look at the way that um, it structures not only our system and our structure, but our personalities. That's it for the q and I'm so sorry to all of those of you online who've posed your questions and that we won't have time to get to them. I would like to invite everyone to do one last big thank you to Arda, Natalie, and Marlene for this incredible conversation. And we just want to 
remind everyone that there are resources for support, and if you are experiencing distress, you can contact SOS Violence Conjugale at 1-800-363-9010, and the Sexual Violence Helpline at 1-888-933-9007. Thank you, everyone.